声音不影响你们吧？他这个内内陆吧，把内陆就行了，嗯。你看，你方向搁错了没有？对，我觉得也是。Professor Chen, thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview. First, I would like to ask you to talk about your understanding of feminism, 女权主义 or 女性主义. This is a very interesting topic. I personally do not think that 女权主义 and 女性主义 have any essential differences. I feel that as for me, I am more willing to use the term 女权主义. Perhaps, possibly, this is because I am involved with the law. I believe that Nu Chuan Jui strives for rights for women. Moreover, striving for rights for women does not imply that women must take away men's rights, but instead women should strive for rights that they ought to have. In the past, women were stripped of their rights. So as feminists, women must get up and strive for their own rights. Through women's movement and through all kinds of activities, women should fight for and obtain the rights that they should have. And sometimes the campaign has to be done from the top down. To put it in my simple and direct way, I feel that Nu Chuan Jui is a kind of set of ideas or practices that aim to struggle for rights that women deserve. You may call it an ideology, a movement, or a set of theory, or a set of theories. I personally believe that it is a process consisting of theory and practice. This is what I feel that Nu Chuan Jui is. However, there are many different kinds of feminism. This is because of different national histories and conditions, different social contexts in which feminism emerges, and differences in terms of group and class. I do not want to spend too much time talking about these differences here. We are all familiar with this. Perhaps people who are involved with feminism, both those that invoke Nu Xingjui and Nu Quanjui, are all very clear about this, and they understand this sort of situation. So I do not want to talk too much about this issue. This is my view. Then do you consider yourself a feminist? Yes, I think I'm a feminist. I do not avoid this question. How have your background when you were growing up, the path of your life, and your work experiences influenced your understanding of feminism? What were some of the earliest things that caused you to think about feminism? Well, if I, I feel that if I'm going to talk about this, there are a lot of things that had an impact on me. I was born into a very feudal family. For instance, in my grandfather and my great uncle's families, basically girls were not permitted to attend school. I have heard my older sisters and mother tell this story about the time when my older sisters went to school. Prior to liberation, before 1949, students had to wear school uniforms. Therefore, if my grandfather came to visit Beijing from our hometown, my mother would take out the Chinese dress that girls traditionally wore and wait in front of the main entrance to the house. So when my sisters returned home from school, they could change their clothes before entering the house. We were born into this kind of family. If we had guests come to visit, we followed a very strict etiquette. When guests came, we were not allowed to be around. If we poked our head in, wham, we would be slapped and forced to go away. Although I was born and grew up in this kind of family, my mother was a person who always strove to excel. In her view, all girls should be educated and should be independent. In traditional society, originally women did not have names, but my father chose a name for her. Therefore, she was a woman who had her own name, and she felt that women must be independent. She encouraged my oldest sister to study medicine, and this sister became a doctor. My second oldest sister became a teacher, and my older sister had already started to get involved in underground activities for the Communist Party. She joined an organization associated with the party. She liked the foreign arts and she wanted to study fine arts. However, at that time, this was not permitted. Actually, studying fine arts was firmly opposed. But in the end, she overcame the obstacles and studied art. Why do I bring up this example? Despite the fact that we were born into a feudal family, because our mother was very independent and strong, she also wanted us all to be independent and strong. Therefore, in this sense, the idea that a woman should be independent and have self-awareness emerged in me when I was very young. 
But in terms of approaching feminism or embracing feminism and being engaged in these kind of activities, I think there are many factors that have led me to this. For instance, from the time when I was young, I participated in a lot of social activities. I had the idea that women should be independent. Later, I studied the law, and I've been engaged in matters involving marriage and family law, which gave me opportunities to know many women and research the changes and some issues regarding the family. Therefore, I feel that these also have had some relation to my acceptance of feminism. When did your first feminist ideas first begin to emerge? I think this was probably a bit later. In the beginning, because I studied and practiced law, I thought that the law was fair and it was just. I felt that the law was the incarnation of justice. But because I do marriage law, as I came to more deeply understand and research marriage law, I came to learn more about many disadvantaged groups, especially after 1990 when our legal institute established a human rights research center. I was in charge of research activities regarding women's rights at the human rights research center. Since then, I gradually embraced some feminist ideas because I came to have a better understanding of women and also a better understanding of the various aspects of society. Since 1990, well, since the end of the 80s, after the implementation of the policy of reform and opening, many problems concerning women reappeared. At that time, we conducted a lot of investigations, and the marriage law was revised and women's law was drawn up. In this process, I started to pay more attention to the issues that women faced. In addition to this, I worked on women's human rights. Therefore, I started to study these kinds of issues. You mentioned a moment ago some topics that you're interested in, some activism that you have participated in. We know you have many substantial achievements. Would you say that your scholarly research and activities are feminist in the category of nuquanzhuyi or nuxingzhuyi? Uh, I think perhaps this was a process. In the very beginning, I looked at things mainly from the legal angle and tried to protect women's rights, protect citizens' rights, and protect women's family rights. In the beginning, I am afraid this was the perspective that I looked at things. Or I looked at things from the point of view of human rights in general, which included women's rights. But I feel that there was a process from that stage to looking at things from the perspective of women's rights and women's human rights as well as doing gender analysis, which means using a feminist approach out of nuquanzhuyi to analyze problems and issues. There was a process. I think that prior to 1995, I was unfamiliar with the concept of gender. I was not clear about it. After 1995, I came to know this word. What was this concept called gender? What was the me gendered method of analysis? How does one have a gendered perspective? Only after the 1995 World Conference on Women that was convened in Huairo, Beijing, did I start to know this kind of idea and this kind of view. But I probably did not truly embrace the concept of gender or this kind of approach until after I started working in our anti-domestic violence network or the anti-domestic violence project. From the end of 1999 to 2000, when our project began to develop, I participated in our first gender training for the project. This project required that each person in charge of a part of the project had to have gender training. If we did not take this course, we were not permitted to be in charge of the smaller projects within this anti-domestic violence project. So I was required to get this training. So only after this training did I begin to have a truly feminist perspective and feminist ideas. So do you think that in 1995, your scholarly research and activism had these two kinds of points of view to different kinds of view? 
Uh, yes, I think that there were certain differences, but I cannot say that they are two absolutely different approaches. I do not think anything is absolute, but I feel that only after the 1995 World Conference on Women did I begin to pay attention to using gender as a method of analysis. Only after becoming involved in our project did I truly use a gender approach to some issues. I think basically this is how this came about. What do you feel is the difference from using a gendered point of view to look at issues in a legalistic point of view that you held before? You are asking me what is the difference with a traditional legal point of view? I feel, well, of course there are differences. When I deal with the law, I can now use the method of gender analysis to analyze the law. This is why we established a research center for gender and the law. This gender and law research center was established because during the course of many, the many projects we had found in the law, there exist a lot of gender blind spots. The so-called concepts of fairness and justice actually apply to abstract humans, but there are men and women. But the law takes man as the standards. The law made by men, based on men's standards, governs the entire society. But the whole society is composed of men and women. I think that in the past, I could not have had this kind of point of view. Yet after this, I think I had this kind of perspective. Our center attempts to analyze some of the gender blind spots and flaws in the law from a gender perspective so that we can help to make our laws be better serve both men and women. How do you see the relationship between scholarly research and activism? I think that theoretical research and practice should be unified. But as for me, this is a change that did not occur until I was about 60 years old. Prior to this, I basically was engaged in theoretical research. Of course, my theoretical research was very closely related to practice. Since I do substantive law, this is different from working on pure theory. I work on substantive law, like the marriage law and women's law. The marriage law and the women's law, for example, are all very closely related to practice. For instance, from the beginning of the 1990s, I have done research concerning the problems related to the implementation of of the women's law and how to make improvements. From the beginning, I set out to protect women's interests. I studied issues concerning women's and women's rights, or to say, our early approach was to say, we set out to protect women's rights. But I underwent a very big change when I accepted the concept of gender. I started using this after the 1995 World Conference on Women. In other words, I realized that it was not our research that would protect the rights and interests of women, but instead we should use the gender perspective to analyze our laws, and we should use this perspective to research social issues and research women's issues. Therefore, we came to realize that we should not adopt a condescending attitude. Instead, we should stand with women, empower women, and study and solve women's issues together. I think this approach will make huge differences. It will enrich my own research. In other words, in the past, we focused on theory, and we also seemed to attempt to make connections between theory and practice. However, that kind of making connections between theory and practice is fundamentally different from the feminist approach that I am adopting now. Now I stand among women as a woman and research and solve our problems in society. In this way, we will gain freedom and greater consciousness of our rights and solve our problems. I feel that this should be very different from only using a legal perspective. Therefore, now I think that those of us who do this kind of work have a high degree of gender sensitivity. For instance, throughout our anti-domestic violence project, we all took a gender perspective, both as a fundamental sta starting point during the whole process. Because of this, things that we discussed and wrote were extremely different from the things written by people who do not have this point of view. Therefore, I think that our theoretical research and practice are closely connected. As women, based on the differences of women and certain situations that women face, we can better study issues concerning women. In other words, I feel that this is something different. Okay, uh, could you cite an example, an actual example of the significance of engaging in activism? 
gave an example. Take, for instance, our anti-domestic violence project. From June 2000, we have worked on this project. This project encompasses 15 small projects. One, for example, is an oral history, and another concerns legislation. I do not work on the oral history project. This is one of our projects that fall under the umbrella of the larger anti-domestic violence project. They interview women for this project. In the interview process, the interviewer and the woman, who is the victim of domestic violence, reflect on her experience of violence together. In the meantime, the conversation enables the interviewee to reclaim her rights. Through the process, she will not only be able to recognize that being a victim of domestic violence is not her problem, in the past, these women often thought they were to blame. Moreover, she will be able to stand up and oppose this kind of violence. In the end, some people who were interview subjects became volunteers for the anti-domestic violence program. Therefore, I feel that this process tells us there is a very big difference between the two approaches. You stand in an observer's standpoint and research these women, or you stand with them together to research women's issues. In this way, we empower ourselves and we all raise our consciousness. This is our own process. I think this is an example. Moreover, we have also held many trainings. For instance, we have carried out trainings for victims and lessons for abusers. I think this process also involves introducing men to feminism or revealing to men how harmful domestic violence is. This allows him to recognize that actually he himself is also one kind of victim. What kind of victim is he? He lives in a kind of male-dominated society. This kind of masculine culture and male control are harmful to men. This cause, this, they cause many problems such as the inequality between men and women, the notion that men are superior and women are inferior, and so on. Actually, people see issues in this way. We can move after people see issues in this way, we can move towards a society of equality, of gender equality. This is the goal of our project. I can talk about another example in our attempt to have some kind of intervention in the legislative process. I have participated in this work and I am one of the main participants. We came to realize that our laws must reflect the idea of gender equality. Take the female victim of domestic violence, for instance. A woman who has been abused over an extended period of time takes matters into her own hands and kills her husband. How do you protect this kind of woman? How do you ensure that during her trial she has the rights that she should have and she receives a less severe sentence? Also, for instance, the application of theories like oppressed woman syndrome in our project will give us a gender perspective in our legislative process when we consider laws concerning evidence collecting, the definition of evidence, providing protection, and stopping domestic violence. Thus, we can propose innovative legislative ideas that have a gender perspective. We have already offered some suggestions on the anti-domestic violence legislation to the National People's Congress. This draft was already submitted to the 10th session of the National People's Congress Legislation Committee. This kind of process and this kind of work are accomplished because we have employed such notions and feminist ideas. Therefore, we could organize the experts and accomplish these actions. I think this is a good example. But in the past, I think the time period before the 1990s, we simply upheld the notion of fairness and justice for the abstract man in the law. How does participating in these kinds of scholarly research and activism influence or affect you person personally? In what ways have they changed you? Personal transformation. <laughs> I feel that, of course, I personally have undergone a very big change. First, I feel that I have changed from a person who originally did not have a gender perspective. Or you can say I used to consider defending women's rights as a very simple process. Or you could say that I changed from merely sympathizing 
To using a social worker's term, I changed from sympathizing to having empathy. And then I changed from having empathy to a kind of true involvement. Instead of viewing these women as so-called subjects whom we must help, I came to realize that we all must work together to solve problems that exist within the women's movement. We should theorize this work and attempt to bring fundamental changes in terms of protecting women's rights. As for me, I feel this is really a great process. I think that this process has a lot of significance for me. In the past, I was only a law person, but now I have been transformed into a new law person with a gender perspective and gender approach. Therefore, I feel that this is very important for me. This is one aspect. Also, I changed into someone who is much more accommodating. Although I seem to be a person who talks fast and is easily agitated, I think that my work has made me more tolerant. Through my change to embrace feminism, I feel that I am now better able to collaborate with others. However, moreover, I usually advocate the idea that all women should unite. Because I think that women, because I think that people used to have in motion that women are a weak community. Of course, women are definitely not weak. Historical reasons have resulted in their disadvantaged position. I do not intend to talk about this now. However, it does seem that the issue of women's disadvantage, especially in terms of political participation, is very prominent in our country. But I think that even though we are at a disadvantage, it is not true that we do not have any strength. But what about these strengths? All women should unite. Therefore, if you ask me what I have to say about the future, for example, stopping domestic violence, I would call on all people to unite. All women and all those who oppose domestic violence should unite and together maintain our wonderful lives. So my big change was that I began to look at things in a much more open way. I think that I have become much more able to embrace different points of view. Some people say that feminism is very radical and is intolerant and so on. However, I believe in the opposite. It was after I embraced a gender perspective that I have become more able to accommodate differences and better understand the multiplicity of views, collaborating with more people and with those who hold different points of view. I think this is an important change in me. Also, another change that I underwent was in my way of thinking. I believe that women should come together better. Women's NGOs also should unite and work with everyone in society, including men, in order to achieve women's liberation or in order to build a more civilized and progressive society. In the current rhetoric of the Communist Party and popular way of putting it, to build a more harmonious society. So what types of changes have your scholarly research and activism brought to the organizations that you're involved in? For example, your work unit or some projects that you worked on, um, like the anti-domestic violence project you discussed earlier. Can you speak a bit uh, concretely about some of the changes? Our anti-domestic violence project began in June 2000. I could be considered one of the initiators of this project, but I was not the earliest organizer. I think that the initiator of this project was a group, which was composed of several people. Our initial participants were many people from different organizations. This brought together experts and scholars from the fields of philosophy, the law, sociology, social workers, medicine, journalism, psychology, and so on. The people in charge of each sub-project were either scholars above an associate professor's rank or women activists. We gathered together to do this work of opposing domestic violence, which was carried out in 15 sub-projects. This project currently has already entered its second stage. I was a coordinator in the first stage. The so-called coordinator is the person who coordinates all of the various people's efforts. You could say that as a coordinator, I developed a lot of effort and energy to the work, to the project. But I think that working this hard was really worth it because while doing this work, I learned many things. I learned about all kinds of things and many issues related to fighting domestic violence. In addition, I learned how to be a leader, learned how to be a better leader of an NGO. 
学到了这个这个。In English, you call this person a leader. Moreover, I learned how to better coordinate and and to better see the whole picture and think about each aspect of what needed to be done. How to encourage collaboration among women's non-governmental organizations, and also how to encourage collaboration and improve interactions between NGOs and the government. I think my work enriched my life, and I studied many things. Therefore, I think that when I have the opportunity for some downtime, I certainly want to produce some very good research on women's NGOs and research on how women, or even how all kinds of NGOs, are contributing to the construction of a democratic society, a civil society. In addition, I would like to research how NGOs interact with society and the government, how they promote a progressive, civilized, and democratic society governed by the law. Because I am involved with the law, I want to research this. It is too bad that currently I do not have time to do this, but I. I think that I should study this. This is for my personal development. As for our organization, I think that due to the development of our project, we had a very big impact on combating domestic violence in society. We have 15 sub-projects, and when these projects were being established, they were very sensitive. We had to overcome many obstacles in order to establish these projects. I'm not going to discuss this process now since we do not have enough time. After we established these projects, our 15 sub-projects all had a very tremendous influence on society. For instance, later we worked together with Women's Federation and on China Central Television Channel 6, a channel that has a very high viewer rate. We aired an anti-domestic violence program. On this channel, we had a project ambassador in those short programs that aimed to promote an anti-domestic violence position in order to maintain our beautiful lives. This aired for a month. Think about what a tremendous influence this had on society. On Channel 6? Yes, on Channel 6. Also, for example, we have, had, we have made anti-domestic violence street signs, which also has a very tremendous influence on society. If you want me to talk about the benefits of this project, I have to say that it has been very useful for society. This could be a way of encouraging people to change their ideas since it will help them realize the harmful ramifications of domestic violence and that domestic violence is a social malady that should be eradicated. In this sense, the project had a great impact on society. Therefore, I feel that these projects were all very good, but I do not want to talk about what I, as an individual, have done, because, as, as I said earlier, the founders of this project were a collective, and there were several NGOs participating as well. From the very beginning, we all felt that it was very important to emphasize coalitions between various NGOs. Many NGOs have joined in our network. We currently have already developed our network members in 24 provinces, cities, and autonomous regions throughout the country. Our network members include the Women's Federation, members of the Association of Legal Studies, research institutions, and even members from local communities, such as the local police station, Public Security Bureau, and the Bureau of Civil Affairs. Therefore, such a wide network system certainly has a very good influence on many levels of society. This group of people has very strong ties. We are bound together. I am only a coordinator, but as a coordinator, I work with everyone in order to complete this project in the best possible way. I think the reason why we could be so devoted is that all these people who work on this project have embraced feminism. We are all willing to make contributions and sacrifices for this enterprise. This is a kind of public enterprise. Sometimes we use the time in the evenings from 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock to hold a meeting or even sometimes find time on Saturdays or Sundays. Yet no one complains. So I I think that in the process, I have benefited greatly. This group of people is all really great. Working with them makes me very happy. You are very humble. You don't want to talk about your own contributions. But I still would like you to evaluate your own work in this anti-domestic violence project. The work, well... I was a coordinator, and now I'm the council president. Currently, during the second stage of the project, I'm the council project president. This, I should say, is a reform. This reform has a price. In China, under this kind of environment, or you could say in an environment where for a long time dictatorship prevailed, if we want to establish a council system, our work might temporarily be negatively impacted. We had some costs associated with this, but I feel that these costs have been worth it. This new system allows us to experiment with a kind of democratic management style, a kind of transparent NGO management style. I think this is really very important. If you ask me about my contributions or what I have done, let me just say that I have set an example for others. 
First, I'm willing to make the necessary sacrifices because I love this kind of work. I believe that women must make certain sacrifices in order to achieve women's leisure, liberation, or for women to achieve independence and, de and development as well as equal rights. As women, we must make certain contributions and love this kind of work. I deeply love this kind of work, and I'm willing to make contributions for this enterprise. I've done some work, and I'm willing to work for this. This spirit probably has to some degree influenced some people. In addition, I think I'm accommodating. When we are all together, it does not matter who I work with, I'm able to get along with them and work with them. I think that society is composed of many different kinds of people. This is something that I've come to know through my studies. Originally, I was not so accommodating. During this process of over 10 years, I realized that I have many shortcomings and problems. But what is important is that I want to keep learning. Therefore, I feel that through the process of doing this project, and the process of studying feminism, I have not stopped learning new things. I am willing to study very hard and learn from other people in my project, from each person responsible for a subproject from many people of other countries and from everyone that I work with. I think I can learn many valuable things from them. Thus, if you ask me what sort of contributions that I have made, perhaps in these aspects I have been of some use. In, in addition, I am able to draw everyone together. Perhaps this is because of my age. I am not the oldest among the participants in this project, but I am rather old compared to many of the others. Therefore, possibly colleagues are willing to work with me and do these things together. If you want to speak of how I have contributed to this project, then I should say that I have been useful in bringing everyone together. Um, you mentioned a moment ago that your anti-domestic violence organization underwent a reform. Your individual role also went through a transformation from a general coordinator to later becoming the council president. The organizational structure has also undergone a tremendous change from the system of project management committee to the council system. Can you talk a bit about the significance of such transformations? I really think this is very significant. For this NGO, the new system separates the management and the decision-making bodies. In this way, I feel that the management level can better, better, better carry out its work. They can better implement some of the Council's decisions and goals. This separation makes supervision easier and makes transparency possible. Our project has from the very beginning been upholding several principles, transparency, democracy, and equality. We want to have these principles. So if we separate the two, we could be more transparent and thus let everyone better understand this process. Of course, this kind of reform has its costs. By this I mean it takes a period of time to make adjustments. Originally, every management committee member concurrently managed a sub-project. We would hold discussions, make decisions, and then execute the plan. But now the organization operates in a different way. Now there is the management level. Sometimes it takes time to get things done because the council cannot directly make decisions on certain matters. The council makes decisions and the management carries them out. The management level has undergone its own transformation in terms of personnel. Sometimes the new people are not necessarily very familiar with the process, and this can possibly cause delays. I think this whole thing is a process. If we can do a job of reforming the mechanisms and make good selections for all of the personnel, I think this reform will have great significance. I think this is especially helpful for transparency, and it is helpful for the democratic decision-making process. I think it will benefit us. But perhaps acting completely according to methods that foreigners use is not necessarily appropriate for the Chinese situation. Therefore, I think that we are in the process of exploring. We are exploring and debating. What sort of role did you play in the transformations that took place in the anti-domestic violence project? I am also one of the advocates in favor of these changes. 
This is what our management committee collectively decided. We all thought that we should manage this NGO in such a way that we would have a democratic style. We believe that our network should not only work to combat domestic violence, at the same time we also want to show how to operate a woman's NGO in China. We have discovered that within a woman's non-governmental organization some problems also existed. Thus we thought we should explore how women's NGOs and all NGOs in China work to help build a democratic civil society. In a democratic civil society, grassroots NGOs should play a major role. Therefore, we also wanted to explore what this kind of grassroots organization should be like. So we thought we should take this step. As our management committee collectively decided that we must make a transition, we wanted to change the original system in which the management committee managed the project as well as got involved in decision making and execution and was both in charge of funds and, op and operation. We wanted to change this whole process into a council system. The council members should all be volunteers not in control of any funds, but have the power of oversight. We hope this new system would enable the NGO to function better. This was decided collectively. If you ask about my contributions, then I would say that I helped with the coordination and operation during the transformation. Of course, we also learned some lessons, for example, how to select people. In the beginning, we still were not clear about how to do this, so we did not do too much recruiting work. Thus, we recruited people who were introduced by those we knew. Doing it this way might not be bring the most efficient or the best candidate for certain positions. But after a little while, we now already have a formalized recruiting body, which consists of people from all levels in the network. Council members, sub-project leaders, and network members of specific projects joined a recruitment team to recruit people for the positions of director, director assistant, and assistant director. Currently, this system has already been built up rather well, and it operates quite smoothly. They have started to operate with few problems. So I think this was a cost that needed to be undertaken if we wanted to explore this kind of non-governmental organization, a democratic, or in other words, a feminist organization, or a very democratic, transparent, non-governmental organization, we must pay a price. It may take half a year, a year, or even two years, but I think it will be worth it because it is good for the future development of the organization. Therefore, we think that this process is necessary. Now, we can say that the procedures for the anti-domestic violence network have already become standardized. From now on, the network, president, and the council will continue to change. The president will change and the council members will continually be supplemented with new people when the older members leave their positions. Thus, there will be a continuous renewal. It should be a very big advantage to the development of this organization. At present, at present the Anti-Domestic Violence Network has regularized its operations. <coughs> Um, as an individual and as a person in charge of this organization, what sorts of difficulties did you face during this process? In what ways were you deeply affected? Difficulties and how was I affected? I think that as a non-governmental organization, an organization like ours, what this kind of non-governmental organization does cannot be narrowly defined. Instead, we are, an, we are an organization that deals with a comprehensive body of work, such as combating domestic violence. Moreover, all of us are people who all have some other work. Basically, everyone has their own careers. Thus, we are all extremely busy. So I feel that it is rather difficult to bring everyone together to work. This actually is quite difficult. Perhaps because I'm a bit older, everyone takes good care of me. Now, as soon as I call them to convene, they come together. But if it was not like this, I think that it would still be rather difficult because they all have their own matters that they have to deal with. China has not formed a very big middle class. Most of us are still in the position where, if I did not have this job, then I would have no way to sustain myself. So these people must first complete their own official duties at work before they can do work for the non-governmental organization. I feel this is very difficult. How can you mobilize volunteers so that they become actively engaged in NGO activities? I feel that this is a rather prominent difficulty in our work. Moreover, I think that women's NGOs, other NGOs might be the same, work on a very specific issue, but ours unites many non-governmental organizations to do the special work of combating domestic violence. 
In this situation, because each organization has its own aspect of work, the question of how we can get united and build good connections with each other in order to operate better poses certain difficulties. Although we have had some achievements, I still feel that we have not done enough. So in the future, we need to strengthen this aspect. As for me personally, actually it's not only me, me. other people perhaps also feel this way. Everybody is different. People are different. They are interested in different things and have different ideas. To unite people with different ideas, to do this kind of work requires a great deal of effort, and I feel that this is difficult. But we can still get things done, and you could say that we have do had some successes. But nevertheless, this is still a rather large problem. People have to deal with conflicts. This can occur at any time. So we still need to do some work in this aspect. Yapatajaputung how do you think that you can overcome these uh, difficulties, especially at the organizational level? I think at such times, since everybody embraces gender and a gendered perspective, we should be able to analyze this, these issues. Think about it. Society is diverse, and people's way of thinking are also very diverse. Thus, we should attempt to seek common ground while maintaining differences. We should look at the good qualities of others. We should combine our strength on the basis of our commonalities while keeping our differences. We should develop the good things. We should gather together to do things. In any case, I basically persist in advocating this attitude and urge everybody to try to seek common ground while maintaining his or her differences. We all should work harder to find the good qualities in others. Moreover, I think that at the leadership level, those people who are in charge of each sub-project should be tolerant. We found that currently within our project, there are also some leaders who disagree with each other. So we had to tell everybody to seek common ground while maintaining their differences and to also look for the good qualities in others. I think that this should always be the direction that we try to pursue. That is to say that I feel that feminists, as people who struggle for the rights and interests of women, should all be especially magnanimous. I think it should be like this. Only in this way can we then all come together. So, seeking common ground while maintaining differences is a principle that you and the network members hold, right? I think so. Moreover, I think that we should all be tolerant. Tolerance is very important. Since everybody is different, I think everybody should be tolerant. We could, should see the good qualities in each other. In this way, we will be able to get along better. What type of relation does this network have with other women's organizations? Other organizations, our network has many organizations within it. What are you referring to? Outside of the network, for instance, groups like Women's Federation. In terms of organizations outside of our network, I think that in our relationship with the Women's Federation, we try to maintain independence while seeking collaboration. I think currently overseas there are many different views. They think that the Women's Federation is both a governmental institution and non-government organization. But I think that it does not matter if the Women's Federation is governmental or non-governmental. The All-China Women's Federation from top to bottom is composed of six levels of networks. These six levels of networks could greatly help our anti-domestic violence Project. Moreover, the Women's Federation is also a woman's organization. Thus, we should cooperate with the people there. Therefore, in our network, the leader of the All China Women's Federation Rights and Interests Department is a special consultant. Various levels of the Women's Federation are members of our network. We have made it very clear to the All China Women's Federation that we are not out to compete with the Women's Federation for work. We want to help the Women's Federation with their work. I made this point very clear to the officials of the Women's Federation. Of course, this possibly is because I am senior in my age, so it is somewhat easier for me to say such things. I said to them that we wanted to help them and we all should do women's work together. 
We have one point that we are very clear about. We ask them, we may ask them to be a consultant or ask them for other support, but we still must maintain our principle of independence. In other words, we insist upon our ideas and our principle of independence. Based on our ideas, feminism, Nichenjui, or the idea of gender mainstreaming, Together, we can collaborate in many aspects. Therefore, we have really good relations with the local women's federations. Basically, the women's federation is willing to work on our project and also willing to help us with our work. In some places, our network's operating center is located in the women's federation, so we work together. The women's federation is very willing to work for women. What we do is to spread the idea that it is not that we are to protect or liberate women. Instead, all women liberate ourselves together. At the same time that we are helping these women, we also empower ourselves. The women's federation thinks that this is a very good thought. Take, for example, the Hebei Province Women's Federation. We feel that we can work really well with the Hebei Province Women's Federation. We can discuss our work with Wu Meirong. They have done a very good job. Qianqi County of Hebei Province and some others are areas where I've carried out projects. Yu Guixin has transformed from a person without gender perspective to a member of the gender working group and takes the initiative to carry out gender trainings there. This is a very example to illustrate my point about the relationship between the Women's Federation and us. Not only the Women's Federation, but also so all NGOs are, are, are all our, our allies, and if they are willing to work to combat domestic violence, our allies can be found everywhere. Because of this, we are better able to do our work. Also, for instance, we have to consider how to work together with the community and the government. In Hunan Province, Furong District, our network member, the district magistrate, took the initiative to propose the establishment of a zero domestic violence community. We told him that establishing a so-called zero domestic violence community might not be very accurate. I said that he should explain the zero part of the term of zero domestic violence community. They embraced our suggestion because we carried out trainings. In the end, they explained that the meaning of zero is that zero non-intervention. That is to say, if we have to intervene in all areas of domestic abuse, this result was very good and our ideas were reflected in the final outcome. The government accepted the ideas and conducted the work very well. Therefore, we have friendly co cooperative relations with others, but continue to uphold our ideas and our principle of independence. Therefore, I think that with the government, we have a kind of interactive relationship. We have coalitions with other, other NGOs. I think in this way, we are better able to spread the idea of gender and feminism. Do you think there are conflicts? Conflicts. I think these are unavoidable. We have a lot. For instance, I will tell you about a very small example. For instance, in some of the communities which our, our experimental sites, when a place to lodge complaints is lodged, is located inside a judicial office or is located in the local government buildings, and who is the main person in charge of this place? Generally speaking, its leading official should be the Women's Federation or women's representatives who are in charge of women's work. But oftentimes, they will call on a male official from the local government. In this sort of situation, we need to point out that this is a conflict. At such a moment, we must bring up the problem. This is an instance of conflict. We have to clearly express our point of view. If we are not able to have a woman to be the director of this place, then at the very least, the assistant director has to be a woman. Moreover, this person should be the deputy director. We cannot only ask her to take the responsibility. We must give her a corresponding powerful position. This is our effort to strive for power because people are an important factor in putting ideas into practice. Take, for example, women's participation in politics. Inside the Politburo, everyone is male. Can their decision-making truly incorporate women's perspectives? Obviously, this is not possible. Thus, our effort to obtain positions for women is really a matter of principle. Therefore, these conflicts are likely to happen. Also, for instance, in training, we have to think about the underlying principles of these trainings. We call our style the participatory style. There are many different kinds of participatory styles. I am not saying that you cannot hold classes or large lectures, but when we think about how to balance large lecture and participatory face-to-face -face training, we must represent our fundamental principles. We can sometimes stretch the rules in order to solve problems, but our principles must be upheld. Therefore, conflicts also exist in such instances. Conflicts also can happen when we try to decide on the approaches of our work or the time of training, because time determines the content of our training. Although conflicts do not always appear at the time of disagreement, we need to have a good discussion.
还有你比如说这个工作的方式上，或者是这个这个这个。这个进行培训的时间上，因为时间就决定你内容。有的时候，有的时候不是说全部是这样，但有的时候，是吧？就像这种时候就需要很好的考虑。How do you feel about the outcomes of these kinds of negotiation struggles? I think there has to be a process. Sometimes it is good. Sometimes it is, sometimes it is done well. In some areas, it is really good. For instance, in our community, the urban communities, we are all doing very well. Perhaps sometimes the result is not ideal, but I think that this takes a process. Since in China we are accustomed to the top-down approach, this kind of process is inevitable. Our project has only been in operation for several years. Therefore, I think that there still needs to be a process. We can understand this process is necessary, but can, it cannot always be like this. We must persist in our views. You work at the Institute of Law at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. A center for the studies of gender and law has been established there. What sort of role do you have in this organization? Right. We established the Center for the Studies of Gender and Law. The Chinese title does not use Xia Hui Xing Bie. We use Xing Bie in our name to be brief. In fact, it should be the Center for the Studies of Gender and the Law. In terms of how our center was established, I should say that the majority of the people who work at the center are members of our anti-domestic violence network. To tell you the truth, the initial establishment of the center was really because of the anti-domestic violence project. During the process of developing the anti-domestic violence project, we found that many aspects of our work involved legal matters. As soon as legal problems are our concern, it is very difficult to move forward with our anti-domestic violence agenda. Take, for instance, the issue of using violence to resist violence. Many women who have used violence to resist violence receive an extremely heavy punishment, the death penalty or a postponed death sentence. Since simply, some simply have been executed and some have been sentenced to life imprisonment, etc. These sentences are very severe. According to the existing criminal law, this is a punishment that is deserved. A woman killed her husband. The woman, for instance, who had been abused, is unable to collect evidence. Domestic violence occurs in the home. It is hidden from public view. So how do you provide evidence? These are all very difficult questions. How do you punish the abuser? How do you stop domestic violence? Our country does not even issue protection orders. Therefore, in the process of combating domestic violence, we discovered things that were lacking in this aspect of the law. Finally, first, there was no special law that dealt with this. Second, the existing law could not protect women who are victims of domestic violence. The existing law does not address the so-called crimes that are a result of the victim's resistance of domestic violence. So, in this kind of situation, we ask, why is it like this? It is because our laws do not have a gender perspective. They lack a gender point of view. This is gender blindness. Therefore, we deeply felt that it was extremely important to have a gender perspective in the law. When you look at the bigger picture, you realize that this is not only an issue of domestic violence. The entire civil law, the criminal law, economic laws and regulations and the social laws, and so on, all lack gender perspective. This made us think about studying the relationship between gender and law. Embodied in all of these problems is one issue, the lack of a gender perspective or gender blindness. We thought it was necessary to research these kinds of questions and to examine our laws. We have also found that in the legal domain, Currently, there are many female students who are studying law, and we also have many women working in the legal domain. There are quite a number of female attorneys and female legal researchers at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, but women's positions are very low. There are only a minuscule amount of female judges, and among the leading lawyers, there are very few men. A lot of female law school students, female law students, are unable to find suitable work. Exactly what is underlying this kind of situation? Therefore, at this time, we contemplated establishing such a center. This was not my personal invention. It was a group of people who now constitute this center and created it together. Of course, at first, it was the women legal scholars. We got together and thought about these issues. 
And fortunately, our president of the Institute of Law strongly supported this endeavor. Our president of the Institute of Law was a man, but he was very, he was very willing to support us to establish the center to research the relationship between gender and the law. This is how we established the Center for the Studies of Gender and the Law. The center was established in September of 2002. In the past two or three years, a short period of time, I feel we have already done some very significant work. We have already conducted a lot of lectures on gender and the law and have held a, gender tra have held a training class. Fifteen universities from all over the country have held their first introduction class in feminist legal studies. We also want to further the process of examining the law. The work that we are currently doing has already received quite some attention from society and legal circles. Woman now, could you talk a bit about how you see the feminist movement on the Chinese mainland? How I see feminism on the mainland? I actually tell you the truth. Since we work with the law, originally we did not pay much attention to feminism, whether you call it new Quanjui or new Xunjui. Like I said a moment ago, it was only in the 1990s that I started to slowly pay attention to this. It was not until after the 1995 World Conference on Women that we became more involved, but it was when we started to work on the project, the Anti-Domestic Violence Project, that we came to truly learn about it and understand it. Our group, this group of people in the legal field, did not have a clear understanding of the concept of gender. But I think that feminism in China, nu xingjui or nu quanjui, what shall I say? Are you talking about the influence that it has had on China? I mean, on the Chinese mainland, for instance, the feminist impacts of the anti-domestic violence network. Do you mean mainly our work? Like your activism and your scholarly research, for instance, in the anti-domestic violence network. I do not think that I agree with your way of asking questions about what influence I personally have had on feminism on the mainland. I do not like this question. No, that's not what I meant. I'm asking about the organization that you're working in. Our organization? Yes, your organization. If our organization has any influence on feminism, let me use the case of our anti-domestic violence network to talk about it. I think that this network has been useful in promoting the development of the Chinese feminist movement in both theory and practice. Our network not only does some actual interventions, but we have also done anti-domestic violence research, an investigation of attitudes of citizens and judicial personnel of the situation of domestic violence in China. Based on this survey, we produced some scholarship. In addition, during the process of our intervention, our real-world intervention, we have theorized the method of collaboration among multiple institutions. Our proposal of the anti-domestic violence legislation fully reflects this. The fact that the results of our work have appeared in this draft should be considered as an increase on its impact. At the same time, we were able to bring in a feminist point of view and gender ideas and method of analysis in our proposal. We also brought forth a feminist interpretation of the legislation. Therefore, you could say that this kind of theoretical achievement in legislation should have definitely been a contribution to both feminist theory and practice. I think that the anti-domestic violence project and network have made a contribution. It facilitated the development and impact of the feminist movement in China in terms of targeting violence against women, especially anti-domestic violence. As for our research on gender and the law, I think that no one in China has done it before. When we started this work and gave our first lecture, what sort of challenges did we face? They were the challenges from the male legal experts. They would say such things like, what? You want to take account of gender in the law? This is ridiculous. What you're trying to do is irrational and has no rational analytical basis. They even brought up questions like this. I am not exaggerating our accomplishment. 
We were the first to do this kind of thing in China, the first to introduce gender into the law. In China, feminism, Nu Chuanjui, or in the popular term, Nu Xingjui, had already entered the disciplines of history, philosophy, and literary criticism. But no one had addressed the issue of gender into the law. But our Center for the Studies of Gender and the Law has already introduced this concept into the law. Moreover, in the very short period of two or three years, we have already offered numerous lectures on gender and the law. We published a book that is called The Studies of Gender and Law Form. Our form has already trained very many people and has influenced many people. Moreover, currently there are teachers from 15 universities who are exploring these issues with us. Therefore, even though we cannot immediately establish this discipline, the discipline of feminism Law. We do not call it feminist law, we call it gender and scientific studies of the law. I believe that one day we will be able to do this. This would have tremendous significance because a very important point of protection of women's human rights, or you can say protecting men's and women's human rights, is the incorporation of such ideas in the law. The law is a very important tool. If the law does not ensure gender equality but remains only a law for men, it cannot possibly bring about the equality of men and women. And the, and the ability to safeguard human rights, including truly safeguarding women's human rights and men's human rights, would not possibly be realized through such a law. The law is drawn up by people and it is established in order to protect people's human rights. Therefore, the law should reflect the demands for rights of both men and women. So we should bring gender consciousness into the law so that it enters the mainstream. Thus, I really feel that the study of gender and the law is extremely important for China. How do you see the future of the Chinese feminist movement in mainland China? The future... I think I prefer using the term gender equality and saying feminist movement. I think China is a country where the doctrine of men and men are superior and women are inferior has prevailed for 5,000 years. Feminism in the West has been demonized. Actually, there are many different schools of thought and many developments in feminism. I feel, I think that one of the best aspects of feminism is that feminism dares to criticize itself. Feminism has grown through the process of self-criticism. The development of feminism is characterized by diversity. I think that this is precisely one of the reasons it is great. Therefore, I appreciate feminism very much. However, how do you bring feminism from the West and develop it in China? I hope it does not matter if you call it Nu Quanjui or Nu Xingjui. No matter what you call it, I hope we can all unite, that everyone can have the same goal, and the people's points of view can be different. But we must work hard in order to make contributions to gender equality in China. We should adopt various angles and use different methods of analysis in our efforts to realize gender equality in China, working within the Chinese context and fully taking advantage of the unique conditions in China. China often is ruled in a top-down manner. Therefore, I hope feminists could creatively take advantage of the realities in China, integrating the top-down women's liberation framework and the bottom-up women's movement. In this way, the work for gender equality will develop better. Thus, we will be able to better protect the rights the Chinese women ought to obtain, realize the true equality with men, and at the same time create our happy life together, with men and women equally working together. This is my wish for the future.
怎么说呢？妇女的应得到的权利，把它真正能够实现，实现和男人平等，同时能够实现男人和女人能够平等的携手的来创建我们美好的生活，这是我的一个愿望。Finally, I want to ask you, in what ways have international feminisms influenced you as an individual and also your organization? I think the influence has been tremendous. If you ask where our ideas initially came from, it is probably from overseas. Some feminists might claim that they have created it, but I still think that these people were influenced by outside ideas in the beginning. Of course, there were also some ideas from within our country, since feminism New Xinjiang in China had existed since a very early time. Today, we are not here to discuss history, so I will not talk about it. How can we look at history, women in the May 4th women movement, and even the women's pioneers a thousand years before the May 4th women movement had sought to defend their own rights and have their own awakenings through their own efforts. For example, my mother influenced me by instilling in me the spirit of self-strengthening and independence. I think in terms of pursuing something like modern democracy, Western feminism has had the biggest influence on us. It does not matter what school of thought. All have some good points that we can take from them. Therefore, when we are talking about what has been influential for us, both the Anti-Domestic Violence Network and the Center for the Studies of Gender and the Law have been tre tremendously influenced by Western feminism. For instance, our Anti-Domestic Violence Network has organized many activities to invite overseas colleagues who introduced how they carried out anti-domestic violence projects in their countries, as well as some of their experiences. We can take what is relevant and then discuss it. Our feminist legal research has been more influenced by scholars overseas. This was because China did not have any research in this aspect at all. Therefore, we invited many overseas experts to talk with us. When we went overseas, we also made a lot of contacts with foreign scholars, so we have learned many things and we are still learning. We want to write re teaching material. Our teaching material will first introduce Western feminism, and it will move on how we can carefully examine our laws and develop our theories. I think this has a great impact on us. I still remember that we first became involved, involved in the Anti-Domestic Violence Project because in 1998 we went to India to participate in a conference. Violence against a woman violates women's rights to life and health as well as violates women's human rights. Before that event, we understood that domestic violence, violence against women, was a violation of women's human rights. But this is also a violation of a woman's right to life and right to health. Although we had heard this before, we really did not profoundly understand or recognize this. But our trip to India really had a huge influence on me. It was precisely the group of people who went to India who then came back, began to work on the anti-domestic violence project. Moreover, in 1999, we went to Sweden to learn about their experience of combating domestic violence. At that time, there were also some people from all China Women's Federation went with us. We wanted to find out such things as how they organized, how they developed, and how many projects they worked on. The plans that were later developed were all influenced from, by what we learned in Sweden. Thus, I think that overseas feminism influenced us. And as for the research on gender and the law, we frequently were in contact with our overseas colleagues, so I should say that they were influential in this aspect also. What sorts of contributions have we made to global feminism? Us? In terms of activism that we are engaged in, I feel that she should have made contributions. After all, we are a member of a big global family. The development of Chinese feminist theory should also be a part of the international women's liberation movement and the global feminist movement. Since we are a part of it, the fact that we have developed such projects from scratch should, of course, be considered a contribution by itself. We are late to the scene. They are the trailblazers. But even though we came late to the scene, we have still made very big contributions. First, in terms of a comprehensive campaign against violations of women's rights, for instance, domestic violence, we have made huge contributions. We have become a collective organization that does grassroots work to combat domestic violence. I think this has enriched the content of the feminist movement. As for global feminism, China has provided a unique experience. This is an approach that has unified uni grassroots work with top-down Methods. Moreover, our research about gender and the law has filled a space in the Chinese feminist movement that was previously blank. Perhaps this does not sound humble, but I feel that our center's work on this aspect should be considered as having filled in the blank in terms of China's role in the international feminist movement. So I feel that the things we do at our center are a kind of contribution to the international feminist movement.
这个中心所做的工作，应该也是一种贡献。Thank you, Professor Chen. I have asked you all the questions that I prepared. Is there something that we have not covered that you would like to talk about? <laughs> what else should I say? Are there things that you still want to talk about? Things that I especially want to address? I have not given this a lot of thought because I was answering your questions. Whatever you asked, I answered. Now you have time to freely talk about whatever you would like. Actually, I think that if needed, we could speak a bit about a good point of our anti-domestic violence network. As an NGO and feminist movement, we have indeed achieved the goal of uniting many organizations to work hard for our common goal. Our organization is especially successful at attracting local women's federations to work with us. They are very enthusiastic. We all felt that it was really good to be involved in this work. Therefore, I feel that this clearly illustrates that Chinese women really need feminist ideas, new trendy or gender theories. In my work, we should not think about these ideas are purely foreign. I think that Chinese women's work to empower women from below and inspire people to empower themselves is indeed embraced by women and welcomed by women. Therefore, as we do this kind of work at the same time that arouses this kind of spirit in women, some people blame women and say that people in dreadful situations must have caused it themselves. I think this view actually does not attempt to awaken women's subjective consciousness and spirit. Therefore, I think that the idea of gender can awaken these sorts of things in women. I do not know if you pay attention to this or not, but the participatory style of our gender training is more effective at the grassroots level. The higher the levels that we get to do the training for, the less popular the style is. So what do these examples illustrate? This style is a good way to cause people at the basic levels to awaken their consciousness and pursue democracy and rights. Thus, this kind of work is better received at the grassroots levels. Therefore, I think our work illustrates the necessity of this kind of approach. Only when you can mobilize people at the basic levels can you work together better. Therefore,我觉得我们的工作越到基层可能越受欢迎。所以我想这个工作就说明了这个必要性。so can we say that you're creating a model with Chinese characteristics? So I feel that in China, when you want to develop trainings and so on, you have to have Chinese characteristics. If you use one approach, approach to work with a lower level, you have to change your approach when you work with higher levels. When you work with even higher levels, you have to change your approach again. Thus, I think that we cannot say that Western ideas are not useful in China. Absolutely rejecting them is not right. But because of some unique features of China's culture and conditions in China, we have to have a Chinese way of doing things. I feel this is very important. So feminism in China, new trendy or new shengdui, must be based on China's own experience. But no matter what, you must know some of the basics of feminism, new trendy. So I think that we have to read and grasp some things in feminism. This is what I want to say. Moreover, I still want to emphasize my special appeal to, to everyone. It does not matter if you call it new trendy or new shengdui. We should amicably sit together and hold really good discussions about these issues and explore them. We should not be divided by factions or borders. We should all sit together and research the issue of gender equality, women's issues, and societal issues. We should seek solutions with various approaches. This is what I call on everyone to do and what I hope for. When we all have academic discussions, we may have different points of view, but our studies of practices should, should advance hand in hand together. Especially in activism? Right, especially when we are doing practical interventions and activities we should unite. We may have different points of view about theories, but we should be collaborating in our actual work. We should advance our movement together. 
While advancing our movement at the same time, our theory will become more mature. So this point is very important and something that I really hope that will happen. Because I am getting old, I will not always be able to do these things. Eventually, I will have to retire.